Hey, welcome to the channel. My name is Jason, and here I talk about all things story. The story I'm talking about today is one of my own. We have reached episode 36 of my series, Worth 1,000 Words, where I attempt to write a 1,000-word short story based on a piece of artwork. I guess I shouldn't say attempt because the video is here, so clearly I finished it. But anyway, today I got to visit the world of sci-fi yet again in space, on the moon, where something is amiss which you will find out very soon. But before I get onto that, let's talk about the soundtrack. And today, uh, maybe I chose this artwork because not only do I love the genre, I love space horror, but uh, one of my favorite composers of all time, Clint Mansell wrote an amazing, amazing soundtrack for an amazing, amazing movie called Moon. And that is what I listened to this and it, it really put me in the headspace. And I know I say that every damn time, but it truly did. However, I do have some regrets about the story, as as all of them. You know, when you're when you're creating things this quickly on the spot, there's always something you would go back and change, improve, make better. But today is not the video for that. Today, you are going to see what I came up with. So, without further ado, let's check out this week's artwork. This week's artwork is titled "Far Side of the Moon," and it's by Morten Solgard Peterson, a concept artist from Copenhagen, Denmark. This has that flash photography look that I that I love. It just really emphasizes the fact that this was captured in a split second. And so I haven't done one of these before. There's a few other artists, particularly one named Oleg. I, I'm, I can't remember his last name, but he does it really, really well. But I hadn't done something in space in a while, or I don't think I've done one quite yet. And so I'm a sucker for a space horror. And so I thought this would be a really good one to attempt. And plus, it will give me a great excuse to listen to one of my favorite soundtracks of all time, Moon by Clint Mansell. But let's take a look closer. We have three men. Well, we have four men. Three men looking at a horrific sight. Their companion is being torn to shreds in this very interesting pattern. I love it. It's, it's like threads or like liquid kind of circling in a in a fountain-like way and it looks as though he's hovering over this crater which is kind of a cool effect because it almost as if you know something is lurking beneath but i try to stay away from action pieces because sometimes for whatever reason and this is entirely my fault they always seem to fall somewhat flat so let's see if i do any better this time let's see what i came up with Torres didn't truly know what darkness was until he saw the far side of the moon. No words could describe it. So dark his eyes fabricated light of their own, in converging and diverging threads that only reminded him of the cover of his high school geometry book. Man, should have skipped the space burrito. Bell's mono crackle was insect legs in Torres' ear canal. He groaned. Get anything yet? Torres checked the readout, appreciative of the real light on the screen. Not a blip. When he looked back up into the darkness, the readout square imprinted itself with every blink. Nothing. Murphy? Bell asked. Heavy mouth breathing was the only response. Uh, it's been, what, ten minutes? Bell said. Can't be far. Torres flipped the sensor box around to use it as a flashlight. The image of the screen burned onto his retina was brighter, so he packed it away on his hip where he'd feel a vibration if anything was detected. Underwater was the closest thing Torres could compare it to, the soundlessness here. Besides the steady white noise of the open line in his helmet, all he could hear was his heartbeat. Midnight swimming alone had been something like this, sitting at the bottom, the pressure, imagining the vacuum of space. Sweat trailing down his arm was torture. How he wished for earth gravity. At least then it might not settle in the crook of his arm for an eternity to itch and itch and itch. Nothing was the closest thing Torres could compare any of this to. The feelings and images of a world that was a world away only made it all the more unbearable. He shouldn't be here. They shouldn't be here. But Simmons, he should be here so they wouldn't have to be out here looking for him. The sensor vibrated. Torres checked the dim screen, smacked it, 
which jostled the readout back to life. Three dots, two ahead, one behind. Had Bell fallen back? Bell? I found him, Torres said. I'll wait for you to catch up. Catch up? I'm ahead with Murphy. Give me the coordinates. Torres stopped, setting his body into a position where his suit didn't touch him. That metal zone that had been a game with him on the long days out here, scouting sectors. He'd stand that way for minutes, his record being five. Now he did this for an entirely different reason, to be invisible to whoever or whatever was beside him. A static hiss found him. Boo, it said. Torres? It said. Torres' helmet took his head to his chest, oxygen hose reminding him he couldn't escape. Simmons? He said. Where the hell? Doesn't matter. Torres transferred to group comms and spoke. Bell, Murphy, where? A shove sent Torres to the ground, colliding with a rock, then rolling down it, face first, to the ground. To his left, he saw the readouts glow, half buried and flickering. Unable to orient himself, he reversed Snow Angel, hoping the coverage would allow him to find it. But then what? A hand picked it up, then the light was gone. That blackness again except for the complex geometry tattooed on his eyes. Every movement, the scratch of an etch-a-sketch, scribbling out what little he had. A touch to his arm, movement up the back of his helmet. He held his breath on instinct, waiting for the hose to be pulled free, the vacuum of space to be nothing like the bottom of a pool. Then tapping, gentle, steady, a pattern. B E L L. I N F E C T E D. Infected. Simmons. Another hit to his helmet. Torres switched to Simmons' calm. Simmons' breath was clipped, words struggling to fight their way between them. Simmons, relax. We're good. Where? <sighs> Not. Group comms beeped. Torres climbed to his feet, orienting himself with Simmons' help. Let's get back to the basin. Beep, beep, beep. Fuck. Torres switched to group comms. Yeah? It was Bell. What the hell are you doing? Thought we lost you. Give me the damn coordinates already. The readout flashed brighter than Torres thought possible. And in that flash, he saw Simmons' face, drenched in sweat, aged, eyes bloodshot and pupilless. His head vigorously shaking. No, 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 no. He was tapping Morse code again on Torres' visor, dead center. I N F E C T E D. Torres, you have one fucking second to. His voice was cut off by a half scream, then liquid static. Simmons' suit went off like a Christmas tree every light more frantic than the code he tapped to Torres. Then his own suit ignited, interior lights reflecting off the inside of his visor, showing him his own twisted face. Then it was as if the sun soared behind them, white hot, their shadows stretching across the barren landscape, marred by stone and crater, reaching toward what could only be Murphy, who ran toward one of those craters, above which floated what could only be Bell. Torres wished he were at the bottom of a pool, back home, decades ago, millions of miles away from the site before him. The group comms exploded inside his head with electronic screeching, but between the synthetic reproductions, he heard a man begging for life, then death, as he most certainly saw it tearing from his chest in a geyser of threads, which sought out Murphy and pulled him into the pit. All of this was displayed in the pure brilliance of the rescue beacon, surely documenting the horror for home to see long after they were all dead. Torres grabbed Simmons' arm, but he was locked as if a photograph, hand reaching as Murphy's had been, the snapshot of his future. Torres ran away from it all, into the light, waiting for his feet to find a stone to send him face down again, but this time... Everything illuminated completely, so he wouldn't miss a thing, taking the whatever hell awaited him, 
because no matter how long he stared at the white light, running toward it, through it, he only saw complete darkness. So what I've always loved about pictures on the moon is, is the darkness. It's just this pure black. And I think it's a, a darkness we, we don't, do not experience on Earth, at least based on the photographs. So, and considering this has such a contrast between light and dark, I wanted to capture that here. This whole paragraph, in fact, is, is a moment to, to create character because that's always the thing I try to do first is identify character uh, you know, through uh, experiences, observations, and so on. Because I think, you know, if you've watched my videos, you know that's my most important thing I try to do. So, you know, I said Torres didn't truly know what darkness was until he saw the far side of the moon. Which, thank you for the title, by the way. That helped with that first line. And then I had a weird thing. I, I had this memory of a geometry book way back when I was a kid where you had these these almost like thread-like lines that are creating these geometric shapes, kind of like like a loom, really. And that's where that line came from. It reminded him of a cover of his high school geometry book. And actually, it wasn't my high school geometry book. I remember when I was a kid, my mom, she went back to college to get a degree. Uh, and then I, she had one of those books. And for whatever reason, that's stuck in my memory. And so we have four individuals in this shot. And so I, I wanted to create a conversation between them. I figured... They're out looking for a person. He he's holding some kind of, you know, sensor device in his hands. I, I wish I had looked up uh, more interesting or more colorful language for what that could have been. Uh, but you know, once again, I don't plan these. I just go, and that's why it's a little vanilla, possibly. So I had to think of four names, and I highly recommend this. If you ever try to do an exercise like this, pull up a list of names. So I just pulled up a list on Google of last names and just picked some. And you'll see that I did change them. Uh, and really the reason why I did that is because long, it's just a word. It's not really identifiable as a name, you know, in the context of that. And so I was just thinking of how that might sound in my head when I was doing the read, read through. It looks fine in text, but reading it, it might sound weird. So I changed those names. And again, still didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, the one thing I was thinking about though, as I was writing this is I didn't want the, the, person who is afflicted by whatever this affliction is in the far distance to be the one that is farthest away. I wanted, I already established that they're, they're looking for somebody, they're searching for some missing astronaut and, but I didn't want him to be the one that they found. I wanted to be him as part of the group. And that's why the, the cheesy space burrito line early on, that's where that came from. I didn't add that till later. And I could have done much better. I, I feel like in hindsight, I should have gone back or I will go back. Possibly. We'll see how, how I feel about it later. When I, uh, I want to see the idea that somebody is sick. And so I think if I would have changed anything about the story, it would have been that. It would have been these subtle cues of, of you to know, okay, something's wrong with this guy. But I don't know, maybe that would have been too much. And plus, within a thousand words, there's really not a lot of time, especially when you're trying to balance as many characters. And I, you can see here when I'm talking about the pool and him, him sitting underwater, it's another moment of characterization. And, and I imagine this guy um, throughout writing this story that, I don't know, maybe he just, he always wanted to be in space. And so maybe the closest thing he could find was being at the bottom of a pool after dark, like at midnight, you know, when no one else is out there, when it's just pure silence. And so I, I took that image or that, that thought, and then I carried it through the story um, later on when I said, you know, this feels nothing like the bottom of a pool. You know, again, like I'm saying, it's, it's all about creating this character. I'm trying to create the story of Torres within all these lines, within a thousand words, actually fewer than a thousand words, because I have to balance the actual story that's happening. So building characterization with little moments like that, I think really speak volumes. And then when sweat trailing down his arm was torture, I just imagine like these guys sweating in their suits and with, with kind of low gravity, like how that impacts the fluid, you know? And so I thought that would be an interesting thing. And I, I do know, I will, I will uh, definitely say that there's a moment in the story when I say that, you know, he wished he was millions of miles away. I did not look up how far the, uh, <laughs> the moon was from the earth. So uh, it just it had a nice ring to it. And so I went with it, but apparently it's, you know, about 200,000 miles away. So I was quite a bit off. So another thing I will, I will most likely edit, but I think it's, it's okay because it's, it's, um, it's, it's kind of metaphorical too. I don't, I don't know that it has to be an actual uh, figure that's accurate, but we'll see how I feel about it later when I, when I do the final editing before I publish this thing.
And I wanted to just, you know, further establish that he, he misses home, like just the situation. I'm sure you've all been in a situation where you're uncomfortable, you're frightened, uh, and you're away from home. And, and really that's all you can think about is being at your house or your apartment or, or wherever it may be. And just, cause it has that, that safe feeling to it. You can see here, I'm just, I'm really messing around with names. I, I named him Lee. I, I was trying to get like a variety of names ethnic background names, but I just went with Murphy, Bell, and Bell is an homage, if you did not know, to Sam Bell, who is the character in Moon, which is the soundtrack I listened to. So if you haven't seen that movie, please go see that movie. It's it's an amazing, amazing sci-fi film. Very small budget, only two characters, uh, one of which is a robot. And here I was, I was describing, I was trying to get across the fact that that Torres, uh, he's talking to Bell, and then um, we get the the twist. Hopefully, it's not like a big twist or anything. But Bell says, "Catch up! I'm ahead with Murphy. Give me the coordinates." So now we've established that someone is near, or something is near Torres uh, that he did not expect because Murphy and Bell are up ahead. And another character moment. Um, you know, we have these little weird uh, idiosyncrasies. I think as people. And I don't know where this came from. It just popped into my head. But again, he's in isolation, I figure, a lot of the time. Maybe they go on rounds. Maybe they're investigating some things. Maybe they have to go out on solo missions periodically and, and walk this very barren, lifeless surface. He played this game where he would stand still. So these guys are are just wrapped, you know, or, or like wearing so many layers. And, and I, I don't know why this popped into my head, but I just picture him standing there, this stupid little game where he's just trying to make his clothing not touch his skin. You know, I don't know if you've ever played, I've never played that particular game, but, uh, you know, just weird things. You just kind of devise in your mind in, in the moments of, of just complete and utter boredom. And so I'm finally sitting here disc figuring out like, okay, okay, Simmons, Simmons is going to be the guy who, who went missing. Why he went missing, I don't know yet, but he's trying to stop Torres from speaking. And that's because... As you know, you've heard the story already. Bell is infected, and so he's trying to just keep... You know, Murphy's probably a lost cause. If he's up with Bell, that's what Simmons is thinking. And so that's that's what he's doing here. He's trying to somehow uh, save Torres from from the fate that's about to happen or to happen to, um, to Bell and, and most likely Murphy too. And I'd never written a story like this. And I, there's a lot of, in terms of like, it's in space... It's interesting because you watch films that um, sometimes take creative liberty and, and they have sounds in space, but as you know, there's no sound in space. And so I, I always kept that in the back of my mind. And, and hopefully, I don't think there's an instant where I instance where I say he hears anything other than voices. At least I, I think so. So if, if you catch anything, let me know in the comments. Uh, feel free to uh, completely destroy my my space accuracy. I'm okay with that. And then this is an Etch-a-Sketch. I don't know why I saw this, but I, again, like, you know, if you've ever used an Etch-a-Sketch, it's these very fine lines that are kind of scribbly. I'm going back to geometry. So the blackness again, except for the complex geometry tattooed on his eyes, every movement, the scratch of an Etch-a-Sketch. So whereas earlier on, I, I kind of created this somewhat beautiful ge geometric pattern that's, you know, that he's reminded by on his, on his book and just some kind of just scribbled mess, I guess. And an etch a sketch came to mind. And again, I think it's those details that, that really kind of just hammer in it. They, they speak character, they speak um, in a visual way without, you know, describing it in such a, in a complex way. And I went to the Morse code, the old Morse code. So there's a book I'm, I'm writing right now. And um, I think I briefly mentioned it in, in the story. And I, maybe that's why I was thinking about this. But, you know, again, it's the only way that these two can communicate by tapping I assume you can hear the, the rustling of things and then obviously the voices and your and your your ear canal and the and the comms. But anyway, we have Simmons and, and Torres, you know, trying to tell them, you know, to, or trying to discuss like what they're gonna do, or you know, he's at least Simmons is at least trying to stop Torres from communicating with these two. And I have a beep, 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 beep. Meaning like, you know, uh these others are trying to communicate with him. So he's he's torn between uh, the revealing the secret of what's going to happen and then uh, also communicating with these guys. So, and finally we have Bell, what the hell are you doing? Thought we lost you. Give me some damn coordinates. So kind of a ticking clock. 
mechanism. And so I'm ramping up the speed, reaching 700 words. So I got to really start turning this, pointing this toward the end. And because there's no speech, I had to, you know, describe things visually. And I thought it would be a really cool uh, visual element of this readout on this, this box he has flashes so brightly. He sees Simmons's face and you can see the fear there. His, he's drenched in sweat, aged, eyes bloodshot and pupilless, his head vigorously shaking. No, 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 no. So hopefully that, that illustrates the gravity of the situation they find themselves in. If infected, it did not do so. And I, I was thinking, I was trying to think of another shorter word because I can't imagine someone literally typing out infected. That seemed like it would take a long time. Maybe that's part of the suspense. I don't know. I guess what I could have done is spaced it out more, maybe broken up the communication, like more little interruptions to uh, allow the reader to to not quite. I mean, once you get to infect or close to that, you you know what's going on. So maybe another word would have been better. Maybe breaking it up would have been better. I don't know. But again, the nice thing though is as long as you hyphenate those things, if I were to put them on separate lines, like if I wanted to create white space, then that would have counted as a separate word. So. If, as long as I have those hyphens in there, that long uh, string is is only one word, which was which was nice because I do it a couple times. And finally, I had to establish this very very bright light behind them, casting their shadows, making their shadows long, so you can see what's what's happening here. I, I love this kind of flash photography look, and what and what I try what I decided to do was that you know all this the, the beeping and the comms and all these things that are going wrong that. You know, Bell is screaming, his his suit is being torn to shreds, that it kind of initiates some kind of rescue beacon. And so that's what I did. I imagine this, some kind of drone just coasting along the surface of the moon, hon homing in on these guys to, to find them and then, um, you know, illuminate whatever the problem is. And, and that's what you're seeing right here. So that is the final image. The curious thing though is in the distance. I was looking at that while I was reading it. I don't know if it's what it is it, it almost looks like another planet or another moon or something off in the distance that the light is barely barely catching but i don't think that would really make a whole lot of sense unless this was actual sunlight that is hitting them which it, it doesn't really look like so i'm not sure what the intention of the artist was but I, I imagine something like that in the distance even though it does look like planet like it seems like it should be a stone or something farther away. The sun, it was as if the sun soared behind them, white hot, their shadows stretching across the barren landscape. Finally, we have the very painful death of Mr. Bell, or the synthetic screeching. He heard a man begging for his life, then his death, as he most certainly saw it tearing from his chest in a geyser of threads, sought out Murphy and pulled him into the pit. And so just in that line, I, I killed Bell and Murphy because, you know, I'm at 900 words. I got to wrap this up. And then here I have the rescue beacon. Um, I probably could have done a little bit more work to describe that or make sure the reader knew what that was because I only mentioned it once. And I don't know, maybe that line's enough. I'm not sure. I think particularly when you're reading it, when you're listening to it, maybe not so much. Um, I'm a very visual person. And, and obviously when you can see that it is a proper noun, rescue beacon, that uh, it's important, it's an object, it's it's something of significance. Whereas me just saying it, you don't get that emphasis. And I like this too, this popped into my head. You know, like people say like, oh, he froze in fear or he was, you know, his legs were locked. For some reason, I guess, and also looking at this thing, it looks like flash photography. It really reminded me of a photograph. And so that's how I described his stance there, the man on the left that we see, who is, as you know, as Simmons. And when I went back to the editing phase here, um, yeah, there we go. Man, should have escaped this, skipped the space burrito. I, I said, well, I got to really seed the idea that, that someone is sick because that is Bell who, it's not the burrito, it's what, whatever's inside him. What I really liked about this, and, and maybe I should have, uh, I think a different route I could have gone rather than someone being affected and dying, is it looks as if he's hovering over that crater. So I think that's kind of a another cool idea that just popped into my head where Maybe there's something in that crater, not necessarily a creature, but something, or maybe some kind of alien life that has some kind of frequency or something that might tear you to bits or some alien technology or who knows. But that's another thing that's it's kind of interesting because he is, he is floating there. And so, especially because he's right above that crater, there's another um, possibility to create the story in a very different way. But, you know, alas, I went the, uh, the infected route, the, uh, the alien trope, but that's okay. Um, you know, these, these stories are, they're quick, they're dirty. And so I think in, in instances like these, when you, when these exercises, you're definitely 
uh, you know, reaching for the easiest thing that pops into your subconscious, or I should say is birthed from that. And so you grab onto it. But that's what I always love about um, when I when I look at this again, as I'm writing and, and trying to like, you know, identify my thought process, thought processes, I always think of alternative ways I can do this, which is, it's kind of cool. Welcome to the end, dear viewer. I am so glad you made it. Let's talk about the story, the far side of the moon, this uh, space adventure action sequence, whatever you want to call it, what I liked about it, what I didn't like about it. So let's start with the good. So what I did like is, I, even though this was an action scene, and I did mention early on that when I write action scenes and stories like this, sometimes they fall flat. However, I was pretty happy with the characterization that I created here. I feel like I gave enough of the reader uh, to know about Torres to where he he actually felt like a person and not just a faceless astronaut as it is depicted in the artwork. I did an action scene very similar to this, not in setting or anything, but uh, just the fact that the story just was literally an action sequence. And that one was, it's one of my least favorite ones because I think I, I, I didn't really create the characterization here. I didn't create any details that really differentiated um, that character back then from the other one who was in it. There's a little world building in it, um, but yeah, it just kind of didn't, and I didn't work for me. And so I think that's really the key is, is bring a little bit of character, whether or not you feel the same way about the story or Torres, uh, that is completely up to you. But I, I felt like I did add a little bit of element there to hopefully define him to some degree as a person. So what didn't I like? Well, maybe it was the alien trope. Maybe it was the person being torn to shreds and you know when i was going over the analysis of the writing I, I was just thinking as i was talking about wow that's cool he's kind of floating over a crater maybe something happened there maybe there's some weird frequency or energy or something just going up from that um or coming up from that crater and that could have been the disturbance or, or who knows maybe they were hunting something maybe they were drawn toward this with that sensor the guy had in his hand but anyway that's not the direction i went the story is done. There is nothing left to be had. And I, I'm, it's funny, I'm kind of considering rewriting it to be more that way uh, for when I do the publication of the anthology. But I don't know. I, I think it's important to capture what I did, right? I mean, yeah, I can edit it for grammatical things and, and any kind of flow or, or confusion, but the heart of the story, I think, should remain the same because I'm definitely going to have a, a forward or, or a preface in the beginning that, that will state what the intention was for all of these stories, meaning that there was no outline, there was no backtracking, despite just, you know, copy editing and, and proofreading and things like that, because it is, it is kind of an exploration of the subconscious, right? What, what reaches your consciousness from your subconscious while your fingers are just moving on the keyboard. If you're still not doing this or, or something in the realm of it, I highly encourage you to do something. It just, it could be a writing prompt, a time writing prompt. It doesn't even have to be a thousand words, but there's some definite magic that happens when you are forced to do something within a certain amount of time. So I think limitations, there is a lot to be said for limitations, for boundaries, for writing in the confines of, of what you're given. If you're not doing it yet, give it a shot. I think it will improve your planned writing. At least that's what I hope. That's what I hope for myself. Uh, I am working on a novel right now, so we'll see how it, how it bleeds into that. And I haven't mentioned in a while, but if you have a piece of artwork you'd like me to write a story to, please post a link in the comments. I'd love to hear an idea. So if you'd like to support the channel, consider giving me a like if you like the video. Subscribe if you enjoy story-related content. Check out my books. Join my Discord. Come hang out with me on my live streams. All the links are down below in the description. So thanks again for watching. Keep reading, keep writing, and I will see you next week. Thanks. Bye. If you'd like to read the story in its non-video format, check the link in the description. I didn't edit anything else. Promise. Thanks again.